joy of Christianity. When Nietzsche was just nine years old, he heard Handel's Messiah for the first time. And he said he felt he had to join in the joyful singing of the angels on whose billows of sound Jesus ascended to heaven. The man who would spend his life as an adult with a mission to attack everything that Christianity stood for started off in life as the son of a Lutheran pastor here in the very cradle of Protestant Christianity. Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche grew up in the village of Rocken in Prussia, now northern Germany. And as a boy, he was passionately pious. This is the parsonage where Nietzsche was born. His father, Karl Ludwig, had a very simple faith. And the household lived and breathed Christianity. Nietzsche's early years were settled and sheltered. His parents had two other children. When he was two, his sister Elizabeth was born, followed a year later by a brother, Joseph. But in the autumn of 1848, when Friedrich was only four years old, his childhood was ripped apart. His father became mentally ill and was diagnosed with a terminal brain disease. It was a tortuous decline. He went blind and eventually was bedridden. One year later, he was dead. An autopsy revealed that a quarter of his brain was missing. This must have been a truly horrific end. The suffering of his beloved father marked Friedrich for life. As a teenager, he wrote about his father's funeral in this church where he'd once preached. Oh, never will the deep-throated sound of those bells quit my ear. The organ resounded through the empty spaces of the church. For Nietzsche, the death of his father posed a profound question. Why had this God, whom his father had so loved and to whom he dedicated his life, punished a good man with such torment? It was the start of a journey into doubt that would come to define Nietzsche's life. Despite the loss of his father, in 1864, at the age of 20, Nietzsche arrived in Bonn to study theology at the university, contemplating a future as a Lutheran pastor. But it was during his time here that he came under the influence of a controversial new method of studying the Bible, known as biblical criticism. And it scandalously suggested that this sacred text wasn't a credible historical work, but largely myth. It was radically undermining the authenticity of the scriptures. And for Nietzsche, it had a dramatic impact. If his father's death and suffering had made him question the idea of God emotionally, then this gave him the intellectual grounds on which to construct his doubt. Nietzsche's loss of belief caused an immediate rift with his family. At Easter, he refused to attend church, crushing his mother's dreams that he would follow his father to the pulpit. And his sister, who'd always hero-worshipped her brother, found her own faith thrown into chaos. But for Nietzsche, his journey into doubt wasn't just a source of hurt for those close to him. It was the start of an all-consuming dissection of the moral and religious beliefs with which he'd grown up. He began to regard Christianity not just as a faith regretfully lost, but as a pernicious influence that encouraged an unhealthy disengagement from the world. Christian teaching, he argued, focused on the next life with disastrous consequences. Earth became a place of bleak exile from God, 
Life was a thing of pain and suffering to be endured, not celebrated. And this emphasis on the life to come robbed the here and now of its sublime meaning. This was a conviction that would dominate his life and his work for the next two decades. Rejecting Christianity forced Nietzsche to flee his theological studies and to seek out a new direction. Right from the start, Nietzsche realized that his loss of faith wasn't the path to a life of contentment. In 1865, Nietzsche wrote to his sister and said, if you wish to seek peace of mind and happiness, then believe. If you wish to be a disciple of truth, then investigate. Nietzsche was living in an age dominated by the rise of science, where the search for objective truth was all consuming. But what Nietzsche saw with searing clarity was that the triumph of objectivity deprived humanity of something fundamental. Without Christianity, there was no set of binding moral rules by which we could all live. There was no solution to man's fear of death. And perhaps most importantly, with eternal salvation no longer mankind's prime goal, life itself didn't have a higher spiritual purpose. It was to finding new meaning in a godless universe that Nietzsche now dedicated himself. And his first glimpse at an answer came at the age of 21. He decided to become a student of philology, the study of the ancient civilizations and the philosophies of Greece and Rome. And he was in a bookshop when he came across a work that would influence the way he thought and acted for the next decade. It was called The World as Will and Idea, and it was written by a German philosopher called Schopenhauer. As he read it, Nietzsche was transfixed. Schopenhauer was an atheist who'd also grappled with the purpose of life, but his conclusions were beyond pessimistic. Faced with the problem of life's endless sufferings, Schopenhauer's bleak conclusion was that it was best never to be born at all. He argued that human beings were in a state of constant desire. If we didn't achieve these desires, then there was discontent. And even if we did, then discontent would set in anyway. His solution was to face up to the fact that fulfillment is impossible. He encouraged us not to strive for happiness in order to avoid the anxiety and trouble in trying to achieve it. The happiest man, he said, is the one who gets through life with the minimum of pain. Nietzsche said it was like looking into a mirror that reflected the world, life and his own mind with hideous magnificence. But whilst he accepted Schopenhauer's diagnosis that life was just a cycle of suffering, he passionately disagreed with his life-denying nihilistic conclusions. The idea of giving up on life and the pursuit of one's desires. Instead, he was determined to find a way of affirming existence in spite of its pain. In 1869, the brilliant Friedrich became a professor of philology here at Basel University at the age of only 24, the youngest in its history. With his first book, which he wrote while he was here, he began to gain a reputation as a radical and subversive thinker. In his work, which he called The Birth of Tragedy, he started to grapple with the issue of how to deal with suffering in a world devoid of God. 
and for inspiration, he turned to the ideas of the Greeks and a new focus of his devotions, the German composer Richard Wagner. On the 22nd of May, 1872, the foundation stone was laid for Wagner's festival theater. One of the guests at the ceremony was Nietzsche. The two men had met six years before when Nietzsche was just a student. And immediately, he was smitten. Wagner became both an obsession and an inspiration. Nietzsche would come to believe that in Wagner's work, he glimpsed what it was that made life itself worthwhile, art, and that the greatest art form of all was music. Nietzsche believed Wagner to be an artistic genius whose music was going to bring about a cultural rebirth based on the classical Greek model of tragedy. It was an art form that Nietzsche was convinced could transform a world full of suffering into something beautiful and meaningful. How did Nietzsche come to write The Birth of Tragedy? I mean, what, what was he trying to do with this book, do you think? Nietzsche wrote The Birth of Tragedy after a series of incredibly intense conversations with Wagner. Wagner was developing a revolutionary theory of art where art could transform society. Nietzsche wanted to provide the philosophy for that. He found in Greek tragedy a model for that thinking. Greek tragedy tells these extremely visceral stories of human beings in conflict, suffering, destructive. Yet it was the dominant genre of thinking about the glory of Greece. Consequently, he found in Greek tragedy a way of talking about the human being today. The human being is a suffering, finding meaning in life, finding the truth. So what is so explosive about what he's putting down on the page? Well, Nietzsche structured his book around an opposition between two Greek gods, Apollo and Dionysus. Apollo stood for light, for the truth of logic, for control. And since the beginning of Germans' love of Greek, they associated Greece with rationality, the beginnings of philosophy. But Nietzsche decided he wanted to focus more on Dionysus, the figure who confuses boundaries, who discovers ecstatic group activity, dancing, wildness, the visceral feelings. And he made that the center of his tragedy. So he was standing against philosophy, against his own subject, against that sense that logic is the way to truth. He wanted to find another sort of truth, another transformative power. But how does he think that Dionysus, with all his darkness, and as you say, chaos sometimes, and loss of control, how is that going to help mankind? Nietzsche was reacting against the dominant German intellectual tradition, which focused on the individual hero, the Oedipuses, if you like. And they saw that the individual who suffered could somehow transcend themselves through suffering, a very Christian message. Nietzsche reversed that and saw instead that the individual somehow lost themselves in the collective and found in a group experience an ecstatic transformational experience. And that's what he saw in Wagner's music and that's what he saw in tragedy. So that somehow the suffering that was everybody's condition was transformed through this ecstatic experience into an affirmation of life this life here and now it's a bit like that sense of a rock concert okay the idea that you somehow you lose yourself in this great ecstatic collective experience and one should never forget that opera in the 19th century was the rock music of its time and wagner was the rock icon of his, of his day and nietzsche believed that's a way that society could be transformed through a sense of the collective experience from which you could go out and change the world Wagner's theatre was a temple to his brilliance. 
but it was also the place where Nietzsche fell violently out of love with his hero. When Nietzsche came here to watch a performance of Wagner's opera, The Ring, he hated what he found. Rather than a place of revolution, the theatre was stuffed with the great and the good of Europe. And the man that he'd revered as a radical, who he thought would catalyse the birth of a brave new world, was just the hero of a self-satisfied festival of opera, revelling in his own glory. Nietzsche stormed out of the theatre mid-performance. It marked the beginning of the end of their friendship and a new phase in Nietzsche's philosophical quest. Nietzsche's rejection of Wagner coincided with a similarly radical change in his own life and work. Whilst he continued to teach in Basel, he began to have severe doubts as to whether it was here that his future lay. He still believed that it was through liberating the creative Dionysian spirit that greatness could be achieved. But he began to doubt that the answer lay with the transformation of the masses. Instead, it was the flourishing of great visionary individuals that would hold the key to the future. And he was convinced that the petty responsibilities of academic life were suffocating his own creative genius. He conceived a deep dread of coming back here to lecture to what he calls the greatest curse of his life. Depressed and anxious, he develops what he called Baselophobia. Nietzsche longed to break free. The key to life, he wrote, was to live dangerously. On the 2nd of May, 1879, he resigned his professorship. As Nietzsche left Basel, he was gripped by debilitating ill health. Since childhood, he'd been plagued by violent stomach pains and blinding headaches. And haunted by the fear that he too would be struck down by the disease that killed his father, Nietzsche's physical challenges had been the final trigger for his resignation. Although his doctors warned that excessive reading and writing would cause him to go blind, nothing was going to stop his pursuit of a life of philosophy. Nietzsche began to crisscross Europe, staying in hotels and guest houses in climates that alleviated his medical symptoms. He would spend the rest of his sane adult life in a state of nomadic solitude. You can just imagine him, ill, troubled, increasingly isolated, and yet with this extraordinary mind for company. Over the next decade, the ideas and thoughts that poured onto the page were simply astonishing. His ill health would mean that he could only write in bursts of 20 minutes at a time. So his books were full of incisive aphorisms, pithy statements, rather than long philosophical treatises. And it was on a train in 1881 that he was told about somewhere that would provide the inspiration for many of these great works. A fellow traveler recommended that he visit a place called Sils Maria just a tiny little farming village in the Swiss mountains. He followed their advice and discovered the place that would become his spiritual homeland. On Monday, the 4th of July, 1881, Nietzsche fell in love at first sight with Sils Maria. Its mountains and forests inspired his most life-affirming ideas. Its beauty reinforced for him the sheer magnificence of existence. 
And it was on one of his walks here, a month after he'd arrived, that Nietzsche had what he believed was the most important thought he'd ever conceived. He was walking by this lake when he stopped next to this rock and suddenly had a vision. This was a thought experiment that Nietzsche believed would help us all to analyze every action, every decision of our lives, so that we could live those to the full. This was his question. If a demon were to whisper in your ear that you had to live your life as lived, time and time again throughout eternity, with all the pain and with all the greatness, would you fall to the ground and gnash your teeth and curse that demon, or would you say that he was a god and that his utterances were divine? It was an idea that became known as the eternal recurrence of the same, and it formed the very essence of Nietzsche's attitude to life, to both its joys and its hardships. Nietzsche believed that even though we all have things that we might consider failures, the breakup of a relationship or the death of a loved one, we should be happy to relive those events too. Just as a pianist learns to master improvisations, so we should learn to incorporate mistakes and imperfections and sorrows into the beauty of the whole. We should construct our lives so we are our own heroes. Um, basically, we should decide who we want to be, how we want to live our life, and then love the choices that we've made. So that the thought of reliving our existence, for good and for bad, can be greeted with a life-affirming yes. The eternal return was an exuberant and optimistic embrace of life. Suffering wasn't something that you had to be redeemed from, as Christianity taught, or avoided at all costs, as Schopenhauer argued. Instead, it was to be embraced, mastered, to live life most fully, one had to risk suffering and overcome it. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger is one of Nietzsche's most iconic phrases. And it was one that he himself was just about to have to put to the test. The philosopher was about to face one of the greatest disappointments of his life. It was in the beautiful town of Lucerne that in the spring of 1882, Nietzsche contemplated abandoning his life of seclusion for a life of love with a woman he was entranced by. Her name was Lou Salome. She was 21, Russian-born, clever, beautiful, and fascinated by his ideas. Nietzsche was lost. Nietzsche and Lou spent hours walking together in philosophy, absorbed in their own world. And Nietzsche brought her here to what was known as the Lion Garden in the center of Lucerne to propose. He'd already asked for a hand in marriage once before through his friend Paul Ray, and she'd refused. Convinced that Ray hadn't done the job properly, Nietzsche was determined to try again. But Salome just wasn't interested in a conventional relationship. She was feisty and original and had no intention whatsoever of being trapped in a life of Victorian domesticity. And so she pledged never to give herself to a man. So when Nietzsche proposed for a second time, the answer was still no. He was devastated by the rejection. Made worse by the fact that his meddling sister, Elizabeth, was jealous of Lou's youth and wild charm and determined to disrupt any potential romance. Elizabeth reported details of Nietzsche's passion for Lou to their mother, 
who responded by spitting out that her son was a disgrace to his father's grave. Their relationship was shattered and Nietzsche was utterly despondent. What followed was one of the most miserable periods in his life, but one in which he had the chance to test his own philosophy of suffering. Nietzsche fled in bleak mood. His books weren't selling. He was in bad health and often suicidal. In March 1883, Nietzsche wrote, In the deepest part of me, an immovable black melancholy holds sway. I cannot see even a reason to live beyond six months. He realized that this was a true test of his own ability to face suffering and to overcome it. I am exerting every ounce of self-mastery, he wrote. Unless I can discover an alchemical trick to turn this muck into gold, I am lost. But in the depths of his misery, he poured himself into writing a new book. One which would prove him to be just such an alchemist. Work that he considered to be his greatest. Thus spoke Zarathustra. Zarathustra had huge impact. It inspired composers like Richard Strauss and writers from Joyce and Kafka to Yeats and Camus. A parody of the Bible that Nietzsche referred to as the Fifth Gospel, it centered around the spiritual journey of a mysterious mystical character called Zarathustra. And in it, the philosopher introduced one of his most notorious concepts, the Ubermensch or Superman. The book is a parable on the importance of self-overcoming. The imagery is of the mountains, and the figure of Zarathustra echoes Nietzsche himself. Nobody listens to Zarathustra. And one of the mechanisms to deliver that is this difficult concept, the ubermensch, the overman or the superman. Who or what exactly is that? It's easier to say what it is not. It's not a biological concept. It's not some kind of superior human race. An ubermensch is someone who is no longer reliant on, on inauthentic external goals. Society gives, gives him or her parents, religions. It's someone who is able to commit to goals that you set yourself. You offer humanity goals and Nietzsche thinks it's a terrifyingly difficult task because the guidelines are missing. There are no blueprints. And whilst you full well know that whatever task you set yourself isn't universal, isn't good for all, it's nevertheless one you commit yourself to. It's one you strive towards. The Ubermensch is someone who can shift and see that the responsibility and the joy of creating life lies not with some transcendent God, but lies within oneself. In pouring himself into writing Zarathustra, Nietzsche not only gave his own life meaning in the face of suffering, but he also began to see that suffering itself was the key to unlocking the elusive secret of happiness. So what do you think happiness is for Nietzsche? We traditionally see happiness in opposition to pain, exertion, suffering, etc. For him, that is not the case. It's striving towards something. Uh, it's suffering through that great task you've set yourself. So 
just flying up onto the summit of a high mountain in a helicopter will not give you the kind of feeling of happiness that you experience when you have spent 15 days walking towards the summit. It's overcoming obstacles that resist you achieving that goal that is part of the experience of happiness. So it's not just pleasure but pain that can pain be happiness. Pain is almost an enabling condition for happiness. Nietzsche never found love again, but he'd succeeded in transforming his despair into a work whose vision would go on to resonate with generations of artists and thinkers. He'd become a living testament to his idea of the eternal return. And he now turned his attention away from the loss of meaning created by the murder of God to the crisis of values left in its wake. Nietzsche continued his restless journeying around Europe. Although his health was deteriorating, it didn't stop him from writing a subversive work called Beyond Good and Evil. Nietzsche himself thought the book was terrifying. A squid-like work that confronted all the dark realities that 19th century science had laid bare. He couldn't find anybody to publish it, so he paid for it to be printed himself. And when it was released in 1886, the reviewers hated it. They described it as dangerous dynamite. Both this book and his next, The Genealogy of Morality, were fired by Nietzsche's utter dismay at the persistence of Christianity's moral values. Whilst many 19th century intellectuals had rejected the faith, they maintained its values. For Nietzsche, this was a catastrophe. For him, they no longer just lacked divine authority. They were a threat to the future of humanity itself. Why should we try to understand this book of his beyond good and evil if we're going to try to understand Nietzsche? Well, this is a book where he really begins his incredibly intense campaign against Christianity. And he says, the real logic of Christianity is a hatred of our own human, all too human nature. That is, we have various drives, according to Nietzsche, you know, sexual drive, aggressive drives, drives to dominate. And Christianity says those drives are an affront to God. We need to push those drives down. But for Nietzsche, that means we need to push ourselves down. So he thinks that Christianity teaches us kind of a self-evisceration, a self-hatred. That is his critique of Christianity. Uh, and w what does he think is wrong with a fundamental Christian moral value? Well, he looks at Christianity and he very disparagingly calls it slave morality. And he calls it slave morality because he thinks it's a morality that is focused on the worst off. That is, the slaves of ancient Rome who were the weak ones and needed a religion that gave them a sense of meaning, a sense of power. But they had no power in this world, so they tried to, he says, and he puts it so powerfully, they lie their weakness into a strength. So he thinks these Christian values, humility, poverty, meekness, he thinks these are values that make it safe for the weakest in society. But he thinks eventually, when these values triumph and become everyone's values, they inevitably make forward mediocrity. But his criticism of the weak really troubles me because these are works that have no time, it seems to me, for the weak, for compassion. Yeah, it's not that Nietzsche thought we should step on the weak. What he thought is we shouldn't be obsessed with the weak. And that's so strange to us because he's thinking, and what's wrong with compassion? But he did have a problem with compassion. Is this one of the reasons that he's so anti the emerging isms of the day, so socialism, communism? Well, a lot of uh, communists, a lot of uh, uh, socialists may no longer believe in God, but they still have this core Christian value of compassion. And Nietzsche says when you're obsessed with compassion, when you're obsessed with how the worst off are doing, that gets you into a mentality where what is valued is contentment. He calls that herd happiness and he says that is only worthy of animals. We are worthy of so much more. And he says if you gear everything to making the worst off as well as possible, you take your eyes off the idea of the great individuals 
who often are extremely egotistical we would say selfish but he says they need that selfishness to make their achievements because it's their achievements that really drive civilization and culture at its highest peaks Christian morality was something that Nietzsche believed was positively dangerous for the future of mankind if humanity was to survive it needed the great individuals the very geniuses that he thought the slave morality of Christian culture was holding down there was a system of values that he did admire. He also talks about master morality. What, what, what's going on there? He's hearkening back to the world of the ancient Romans and the ancient Greeks. They were both massive slave-owning societies. But he said these people were masterful in a way that, with their gods, they celebrated themselves. Like someone like Achilles, the great warrior, he could worship Ares, the god of war. But in doing that, he was worshipping himself. So he says the masters have a religion that affirms themselves, whereas the slaves have a religion of Christianity which actually disavows their nature. The master morality of the Greeks, as Nietzsche saw it, glorified ambition, strength and power, and despised compassion. Nietzsche was convinced that a revision of moral values was needed for a post-Christian future, and that such a morality needed moral legislators. In his letters, he announced that his next task was a magnum opus in which he would lay out a new value system to fill the void. But it wasn't to be. In April 1888, Nietzsche moved to Turin, this would be his home for the rest of his sane life. When he arrived here, he was at his most brilliantly productive. In an almost constant state of euphoria, he produced four books in a year. And as he walked through the city, he said he felt like a god. But it was in the beauty of this Italian city that Nietzsche's mind began to decay. And it's in the letters he wrote at the start of 1888 that the very first signs of his madness can be glimpsed. These letters give us a troubling insight into Nietzsche's state of mind at the time. Rather than the brilliance that once poured onto the page, these are bizarre and deranged. Here he's writing to Bismarck, one of the most powerful statesmen in Prussia, but he signs himself the Antichrist. On others, he calls himself Dionysus, the Greek god. And here, he simply ends the crucified one. Nietzsche had megalomaniac tendencies, claiming that he was preparing an event which had the potential to split the history of humanity into two halves. The owners of the house where he was staying were alarmed by his ecstatic piano playing. And sometimes they could just about make out that he was leaping about his room, stark naked, yelling as if he was recreating a Dionysian orgy. Events came to a climax in one of Turin's piazzas. Nietzsche saw a coachman thrashing his horse with a whip. He flung his arms around the animal's neck and, with tears streaming, collapsed to the ground. The final sane act of a man who'd spent his life criticizing the weakness of human compassion was one of profound pity. Seven days later, he was incarcerated in an asylum in Basel. Nietzsche never regained his sanity. At the age of 44, one of the most searing philosophical minds in human history had disintegrated. For the next decade, until his death in 1900, he'd write nothing. <laughs> <laughs> 
When he arrived at the clinic, the friend who brought him wrote, he suffers from delusions of infinite grandeur. It's hopeless. I've never seen such a horrific picture of destruction. No one knows exactly what caused Nietzsche's descent into madness. But while Nietzsche's mind collapsed, his work started to take on a life of its own. In 1897, Nietzsche was brought here, to his sister Elizabeth's house, to live out his remaining years. Declared clinically insane, until his death, Elizabeth would be his sole carer. While Nietzsche lived here, Elizabeth treated her brother like an attraction in a sideshow. She invited visitors in to stare at him, and she held soirees for his disciples, while his disturbed groaning could be heard from upstairs. Today, the house is a shrine to Nietzsche, created by his younger sister, who dressed him in white as if a prophet. Yet its pristine rooms are chillingly devoid of any trace of his personality. Elizabeth collected together Nietzsche's writings, including notebooks for an unpublished masterwork that Nietzsche had planned before his mind shut down. Notebooks he'd never intended the world to see. What exactly is it that we're looking at here? So here we're looking at two notebooks of Nietzsche's in which he's working up to this great work um, called The Will to Power, a work of tremendous ambition because what he's attempting, you can see from this notebook here, is a revaluation of all values. I mean, it's extraordinarily exciting to see this because here he is trying to overturn the whole of Western morality because people deep down no longer believe in it, though they're going on like the herd, as he calls most of us, living their lives by it but there is no longer a god to back it up so he's saying we need to find a new morality and that's his fundamental task is it as simple as it sounds the will to power is, is he saying that power is the identifying organizing principle for humanity he's saying actually if we look at how people live and behave and strive really what they're after in life from infancy onwards is power and therefore, any morality that's going to fit with human nature needs to be a morality that sees power as the goal that we all seek, albeit in very different ways. So it's more than just something, because we've got Darwin at this time with his survival of the fittest, but Nietzsche's taking that idea way beyond what Darwin's he saying. He is. Well, superficially, they sound similar, but in fact, they're profoundly different, and Nietzsche despised uh, Darwin, and he has contempt for any way of living life that simply seeks to preserve yourself and your progeny. And the real difference is that the will to power is concerned that human beings should do more than merely preserve themselves. They should aim for great things. They should aim to be great statesmen or to be great philosophers and design new worlds, as it were. And that might involve sacrificing preservation. That might involve an early death. It might involve leaving no children. For him, the will to power is about seeking the exceptional. But Nietzsche seems to have recognized the flaw in his own idea. Perhaps his last sane act was the decision not to publish what he'd written. Nietzsche was himself against all philosophies that attempted to reduce the world to one principle, whatever that principle might be. And in a sense, his attempt to reduce the world to the will to power was, as he would put it, intellectually unclean. And I think that's why this work ultimately failed, because he realized that he was 
being untrue to himself. And what clues are in, in these notebooks themselves that he has given up? Well, I mean, there are small signs. Um, for example, here in this version, he's written a shopping list over these profound thoughts. And here we have the word toothbrush, signpost. So I think if you start writing shopping lists over your great masterworks, that suggests that you no longer have respect for them. But the work he abandoned was published with devastating consequences. Nietzsche died here of a stroke in 1900, but his death gave Elizabeth the opportunity to appropriate not just the dog days of his life, but his life's work. Elizabeth had hero-worshipped her brother and lived her life in his shadow. Now as literary executor, she set about publishing Nietzsche's notebooks in a collection entitled Will to Power. Although she worked with various editors, she simply dismissed them if they disagreed with her. Nietzsche's work was edited and manipulated to suit her own political ends. Elizabeth was a supporter of the Nazis and began to court the party's leaders. In 1934, Adolf Hitler visited this house and she even gave him her brother's walking stick. Elizabeth was so extraordinarily successful in promoting her brother and his works that by the end of the 1930s, Nietzschean thought and themes pervaded German society. And this was disturbingly reflected in one of the most compelling propaganda films of all time. In 1934, Nazi supporters gathered in Nuremberg to hear their leader speak. It was a moment captured in a film commissioned by Hitler himself. Terrifying, electrifying, the words and rituals of the Nazis echo Nietzschean thought. It was called Triumph of the Will. The film begins with Hitler descending from the clouds, echoing Zarathustra, an ubermensch coming down from the mountains with his new morality to be greeted by the herd. An ubermensch offering a system of morality in which traditional Christian values are to be inverted. Das ist das Volk, einst nicht wird, sondern das es hart sein kann. Where the state will exert the will of the most powerful and the weak and the helpless will be destroyed to generate a greater humanity. So closely associated had Nietzsche's ideas become with the aims of the National Socialists that one of its most influential thinkers, Alfred Baumler, said, when we call out Heil Hitler, we greet with the same cry, Friedrich Nietzsche. And yet, had he lived to see this, Nietzsche would have been horrified. His Ubermensch wasn't a master of eugenics. He was a symbol of man's potential. His will to power was not a call to nationalism, which he despised, but a recognition of our drive to overcome our limitations. And he was vocally opposed to anti-Semitism. The nature of the Nazis was a hideous parody. Just months before his final collapse, Nietzsche wrote, I confess that the deepest objection to the eternal recurrence, my truly most abysmal thought, is always mother and sister. How prophetic his words turned out to be. And yet perhaps the blame for his misuse is not entirely Elizabeth's. Nietzsche would never have advocated Hitler's final solution, 
But he was naive if he thought that his work would not be misunderstood. Evil loves nothing better than a void, and the philosopher's clever, ambiguous aphorisms could easily be put to the service of evil. Even when he was entirely sane, Nietzsche said that bad would be done in his name. The sister and the brother must share responsibility for the life that his work took on after his death. A century after Nietzsche's death, the crisis created by the murder of God may seem exaggerated to us today. The modern world hasn't collapsed. God as the unchallengeable source of moral values seems to have stepped aside relatively quietly. But maybe that's because we lack Nietzsche's unsettling prophetic vision, his wild imagination. If we choose to wear the blinkers of the herd, could it be that we're staring with unseeing eyes into the very abyss that he predicted? He believed that what would fill the void was a chaos of cultural preferences, a mess, an overload of personal choices, pernicious in Nietzsche's eyes because they perpetuated the empty values of the herd that he so despised. And perhaps Nietzsche's most chilling vision was of the humanity that would populate this post-Christian world. These people he called the last men, and for them he reserved his most fervent fury. These were men and women who turned their backs on challenging ideals, but felt they were content. They had a banal existence. They did everything in their powers to limit excesses of joy or sorrow. Their concern was the trivial and the narcissistic. And so they lived lives of timid mediocrity, fooling themselves that they were happy. They bought into what Nietzsche described as the religion of comfortableness. Could this be a devastating description of the modern world? A world that shies from the risk of striving for greatness. A world that shuns higher values and celebrates the mundane. The last men are Nietzsche's greatest fear. They look at a star, by which he means the fiery potential of beautiful lives fully lived, the meaning of all existence, and they have no desire even to pursue it. They merely blink. Before Nietzsche fell into madness, he wrote, if you stare long enough into the abyss, the abyss will stare back into you. The chaos that confronted Nietzsche in his final moments of sanity is arguably our own. The question of not just how we should live, but the point of our lives is still one of the greatest challenges of the modern world.